Now that we understand stress and how it can affect us and our lives, let's learn more about what's happening in our brain to cause it and what, if any, ramifications we may experience as a result of long-term stress. Did you know that stress was first discussed by Hans Silje, a medical student at Montreal University in the 1920s? I definitely didn't, and it was so fascinating to learn about. He noticed that all of his patients in the hospital were strained because of a non-specific pressure or quote unquote stress. And he spent years doing research on this hypothesis until he and his colleagues figured out that there was actually a specific recipe that creates stress. And it's nuts. No, seriously, that's the acronym. The recipe for stress is novelty, that's the N, unpredictability, it's the U, threat to the ego, T, and sense of control, S. It's nuts. So what this really means is that in order for us to feel stressed, we have to encounter something we don't fully understand or haven't done before. And we aren't sure how it works or how it will turn out. And we feel that the outcome could harm our sense of self or our confidence. And we don't really feel like we have complete control over any of it. Even just by talking that through with you, it's no wonder stress is so common. I can think of many things in my life that meet this recipe for stress. I'm also interested to find out where our stress response comes from. Can it possibly be good for us? And do we all experience stress in the very same way? Also, I'm curious if stress is just a precursor to burnout or anxiety, or if it's simply a part of them. I would also like to learn how we can heal from the effects of stress. And in order to answer all of these questions, we are gonna go on another field trip. And this time, we are going to the Missing Peace Center for Anxiety, where they treat all things stress and anxiety related. And just as a reminder, this video series is an educational project sponsored by Google. You guys, I am so excited to be here. I'm excited to learn. We're gonna learn all about stress in the brain and the body. Thank you so much for making time. Tell us where we are. Oh, thank you, first of all, for coming. Of course. You are at the Missing Peace Center for Anxiety. I'm Laura Rhodes Levin, uh, and I'm so excited to have you here. And you created this wonderful place. I did. This is, this is my dream. I can't wait for you to show me around and to learn all the wonderful things you're doing here. Yes, come on along. Um, oh, wow. So this is one of our alpha stimulation rooms. Oh my God, it's like my childhood bedroom when you used to have all those sticky yes, glowing yes. stars, but way better. <laughs> so alpha stim is for anxiety, depression, and insomnia. It's by prescription only, but we just use them here with, our, with the clients. And what they do is they put a little thing on their ears. Uh -huh. When you're anxious or stressed out, your brain's in beta. It's a uh -huh. very fast wave. When you watch TV, you're an alpha. Which is why you're like, That's highly I stimulant. want pizza. Because <laughs> you're suggestible, right? Yeah. You actually are suggestible. So wow, never our thought client, about that. Right? So interesting. So the client's sitting here, they put the alpha stim on, and we have them listen to a guided meditation on whatever it is they're working on. So with, you know, abuse, if they're working on getting out their voice, or in the case of high stress, about loving yourself and yeah. making yourself a priority. So... That's they really do that cool. in here. You might have to see if I'm an alpha or beta. <laughs> right? You're in beta, I assure you. <laughs> and this is another come to your senses room. Oh, wow. Talk about sandbox. Right? <laughs> this is so nice. This is, so this is like Hawaii. It is. You smell the coconut. You listen to the waves. You've got the movie rolling of the sunset. Mm -hmm. And they start to associate work with less stress. We can also incorporate the things that make us feel good into our work lives. If you look at Richard Branson's office somewhere, mm -hmm. his, his chair is like a hammock and it's oh, out on a thing. Super and his, relaxed. I don't have a desk in my office because I don't yeah. like sitting at a desk. And we do, there, every room you see, people are in for about an hour. Okay. There's a massage going on in here. It's not just your regular massage therapy because we hold trauma in our body, mm -hmm. we hold stresses in our body, and we disconnect. So if we have a headache, if we're hungry, we're like, no, nope, don't have time, don't have time, don't yeah, have time. Yeah, gotta keep doing my thing. Yeah, and she'll press and she'll be like, hmm, this is kind of tight, what's in there? And people just are like, 
I don't know why I'm thinking of my uncle right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's powerful, powerful. So yeah, yeah. Another neural room. Okay. Um, This is the art studio. How busy and you it is. don't have to be an artist. So this lovely lady, she mm-hmm. this is the birdhouse, yep. and and what you people see on the outside is what they see on the outside, and then the oh, inside yeah. represents your inside. Oh. So she's got like sparkles on yes. the inside. The art therapist said, "Why the black roof?" And she said, "Because from now on, if anybody looks down on me, they go into a void." Oh, I love that. Right? That really gave I me was goosebumps. just like, <laughs> oh. oh. So I I always have her keep Mm -hmm. this one out because I just, I love this one. Neurofeedback is the real science part of the center. I don't know if you're familiar with neurofeedback. I'm really not. I'd love to hear more about it. I've known of it happening in clinics I worked at, but I haven't done it myself and I don't understand it really. It's so much easier to understand than it seems like it is. So... It's, and it's, I call it the men in black because it's used by NASA. It's used by the armed forces. It's used by sports teams. Because when you're in your head, you know, you're not going to make the shot. Yeah. So the way it started is some neuroscientists like 60 years ago thought, okay, let let me backtrack a little bit. Your brain is amazing. Right now, if you have a cut on your leg, your leg is sending up signals through your nerve endings to your brain, cut on leg, and the brain goes, okay, do this, and it sends those signals back down. And you, we're having a conversation. You're not even aware of it. Yeah. It's sending signals to your body for your circulation, for your digestion, for your heart. The brain's amazing. And it does it all through nerve endings. So all the messages go up into the spinal cord, feed it to the brain, messages get sent back down. The irony is the brain itself doesn't have nerve endings. When they do brain surgery, the person's awake. They're like, yes, if I, I poke know here, that. does mm-hmm. your leg still move? And yeah, I've, I've seen that on TV. So yeah, I know. I've watched like the live. You can see like surgeries and stuff. Interesting. Okay. Right? Okay, so brains don't feel brains anything. Brains don't feel anything. They don't have nerve endings. So how can they see and hear themselves? So these neuroscientists thought, what if the brain could hear itself and see itself? Would it self-repair? Would it fix itself? So what we do is we take these electrodes. Now, here, if you want to have a seat, please do. Yeah, I'm very Um, interested. So you know an EKG where they put the stickers on your chest and the pen goes up and down? Yeah. So you know those stickers aren't sending anything into your chest. No, it's They're just reading electrical activity. So that's what we're doing with the brain. Oh, okay. And in the case of stress and anxiety or and trauma, we're registering back to you the amygdala, the limbic system, mm. the part of your brain that's totally overwhelmed. Yeah. And what happens is that brain activity gets turned into fractal images of your brain. This is actually a fractal image of my brain years ago. Oh, when you were super stressed out. Right? (laughs) Well, I know you told me, so I'm like cheating. totally. (laughs) Actually, it was a little bit after that. Okay. um, And you would sit with the electrodes on your head. I picked a good one. There's uglier ones. It's beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. It's like a work of art, your brain. (laughs) Um, They all are. So you would sit and you would watch fractal images of your brain, and your brain would be looking in a mirror and going, oh, my God, why am I acting like I'm running from a lion? There's no lions in here. Okay, I mm. I need to calm down. And it's very cool for like yeah. five minutes, and then it's just bad spirograph meets Pink Floyd. Oh, okay. You're so bored. <laughs> yeah. So they've really improved the technology now, and now we just pop in a movie like oh, yeah, Bachelor. Yeah, I want on Bachelor. Anything. <laughs> exactly. So that gets put into the monitor. So your mind and your brain are different. So your mind gets bored with that. But your mind doesn't get bored watching a movie that you like. Yeah. So your mind is watching the movie. Now, the movie's going to look the way it normally w- looks, but it sort of shrinks and does this fading, and it's oh, that brain activity incorporated into the movie. Wow. So while you're watching the movie, the brain's going, oh, my God, my hair's... A- uh. It fixes oh. itself. Wow. Okay? But it's not a quick fix. So if you think of that that dysregulated brainwave Mm -hmm. as grass standing straight up in the air, when you step on grass, it goes flat. But when you move your foot, it slowly pops back up. But Mm -hmm. if you keep walking on it over and over, you create a new pathway. 
Yeah. And that's what we're doing here. So with each session, we're bringing that dysregulation down, bringing it down, bringing it down until you don't need the computer to do it anymore. Your yeah. brain is in a healthy state. And if you think about it, the way we are today socially, I know we're all modern on our hoverboards and stuff, but we're still primitive. Yeah. So much so that we have to invent a gym because we don't chase mammoth anymore. No. We're not climbing the steeps for lavender. Yeah, our so, lives aren't as active. Right? So we have to create false environments to keep our muscles mm -hmm. in shape. Yeah. Our brains right now, with social media, with work, with phones, with even driving at 60 miles an hour or 70 mm -hmm. down the freeway, <laughs> your brain is in a fight or flight state the whole entire time because when someone comes in, you're laying, yeah. you're, yeah. you're ready. Mm -hmm. So our brains, our limbic systems get so overwhelmed. And just like we need a gym, we need something for our brain to help regulate and keep our brains calm and in shape. So when you get your feedback from those different like nodes or whatever, mm -hmm. you, then is it just like how many sessions? I mean, you said it's like a slow process. So I have to sit down and we just wait till we see a change. No, it's or, really self-report. People okay. start to feel better. After the first session, you feel like a little tired, a little relaxed. Some people say they feel like they've had a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. And then within an hour or two, it kind of goes away. Okay. But then that feeling stays with you for longer and longer. When I first got trained doing this, I was told about 20 sessions. I don't know. I, I think it takes way more. Okay. We're looking at 60, 80 sessions because don't forget, once the body gets relaxed, mm -hmm. the brain is great. It'll fix whatever it wants to, not what we tell it to always. It, it will. Yeah. So now you can work on peak performance. You can mm -hmm. go to the gym to lose five pounds or you can bulk up. Yeah. So you can get your brain into a healthy state. Yeah. I've had guys come in to improve their golf game. Oh, interesting. So the yeah. longer you stay with it, the healthier your brain gets. And then there's a point where you really are done. Okay. And then That's going to be different for everybody, I would presume. Just everybody. like everything. Right? With yeah. kids, it's much faster. Uh -huh. Of course. Um, but then that's where the short-term tools come in. So if like later on down the line, something happens, a, a flood, a rain, a divorce, something. Yeah. Now those short-term tools, you can relax yourself. And some people come in for a tune-up now. And yeah. Then, like, give me a sessions for like a month and I'll be back on my... Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, that's cool. It's this is what started it's a gym all for your of brain. it. It really is. Yeah. It is. I call the place a spa for your brain. It is. It's really cool though. But it's also nice to. I would assume that like twenty sessions is kind of where you start to not be as symptomatic as you were. Absolutely. And then it's almost like if we start. Let's say I'm going to start running. Heaven help me. And <laughs> I start and I run for like a minute. I'm like, ah, ah, and then I start running for three, and then I kind of start, it's exactly. not as hard anymore. I get more used to it in the same way that my brain would kind of get more used to, yeah. to this. And, it and by 10 so sessions, bad. you're definitely noticing a, a substantial change. The people around you tend to notice if you have more joy, light in your face, you you know. Yeah. They're like, what'd you do? Something's different. Mm -hmm. And that happens with teenagers, especially mm -hmm. teenage boys. They're like, I'm like, so how you feeling? How you doing? I don't know. <laughs> same. And the mom's like, no. He's like, so much better. <laughs> right? Of course. So, what prompted you to start this? Um, it kind of evolved on its own. I started years ago in meditation, and then I was teaching meditation someplace, and they said, we want you to learn neurofeedback. Neurofeedback mm -hmm. was mind-blowing, literally. <laughs> so, <is> literally. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I started becoming a neurofeedback therapist, and then people were saying, why aren't you my real therapist? I'm like, oh, I'm in my 40s. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah, sure. And I went back to school. And, oh, wow, yeah. Gathered those 3,000 hours. Yeah. Oh. Bless your heart. Right. Oh. And still doing the neurofeedback practice wow. and the intern yeah, and school. And yeah. But um, I feel like I'm a really good therapist, but it takes more than flour to make a cake. Mm -hmm. I was saying, yeah, you, I have found that my clients need other things. They need to get in touch with their sense of smell. They need to get in touch with their bodies when they're working with art. They're accessing a different part of their brain. So as anxiety and PTSD and trauma became my um, focus. The more I can help and the more I learn, the more I want to offer to people. 
Yeah, so. and it's nice that it's in the same facility because I know personally in my practice, I refer everything out mm. or it's like homework, right. which it would be great if I can be like, okay, so next week we'll put you down here for this exercise. Thing. Yeah. I want you to do this breathing class. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like you to do, you know, this art class, kind of art, you know, therapy. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to have it all. So it'd be my colleagues within the same suite yeah. versus me having to try to find it with for them online or, you know what I mean? It's just a much more laborious process when it's not just out the door. It is. And a lot of the stuff we do here, I think people are reluctant about. It's like, well, nobody's reluctant about the massage, but it's like of course art not. therapy. Right? <laughs> I don't know. And when you're mm -hmm. bringing them in and you're saying, this is your program, this is what you're going to be doing. Yeah. No one with anxiety wants to do um group therapy. Oh, of course not. <laughs> no, the funniest, like, this is a, a joke I laugh about myself, is one of the first groups I tried to run with a girlfriend of mine was a social anxiety group for teenage girls. <laughs> and it didn't go well. And we had, like, three people show up out of 15 parents who had RSVP'd them. And they slowly got more comfortable. But, like, the, I think we ended up with four total. And it was helpful at the end. Mm -hmm. But it took them um, four or five weeks just to warm up. Well, and that's what's nice about having a group that's been around. Because even when new people come into it and they have that look like, please launch me from this chair. Uh -huh. right now, I want to disappear. Get, right. Shoot. They get the assurance from people who say, I know exactly how you feel. Mm -hmm. And they bond so well that actually when we had a close for the fires. Oh, yeah. My groups met outside of here. They were oh, like, cute. we got together because we just wanted to like talk and we couldn't come to the center I'm like great that's wonderful that's, yeah yeah how cool so when you have it all here instead of referring you're just like okay this is what you're doing you've trusted me so and then they yeah. see the benefit of it no it's wonderful it's a, it's a beautiful facility thank you so we're here today to talk about stress mm -hmm. obviously um how would you define stress okay I know it's tricky, so, but it's okay. I'm like, just put you on the spot. It's I can take it. I won't get stressed. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so just like we're, we're so familiar with a spectrum term now, mm -hmm. stress, I feel, is on the anxiety spectrum. And when people come in and they're saying, there's something wrong with me, I'm really anxious, the first thing I tell them is, what you think is wrong with you is actually what's right with you. Hmm. We are supposed to have anxiety. It's essential to our survival. So imagine you're a little girl and you're playing in the meadow with your friends and you hear a rustle in the bush and you see a big fuzzy face and it eats your friend. <laughs> <laughs> now you just met a lion for the first time and that goes into your brain and it stays there and it's supposed to stay there so that the next time you see a big fuzzy face in the bushes, you run. Yeah, you get out of there. And the more and more anxiety or scary things we experience, the more and more we become overwhelmed. And in today's world with phones and traffic and computers, our limbic systems are very much overtaxed. And, and you've got survival of the fittest. I mean, we're all the people who've made it all this way. It's true. So anxiety is already our specialty. <laughs> it was, it's from the past. It's like through our lineage, essentially. Exactly. Because our people ran away from the lion. That's right. That's why we're here. We're <laughs> I didn't lion even think runners. about it that yes. <laughs> way. Like, it's like generational trauma. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> We've done studies with um, Holocaust victims their children have higher levels of anxiety because we don't just inherit hair color, we inherit emotion. Yeah. And so stress is something that's really, really important, but the balance and learning, um, I was saying earlier, the term self-care is the most overused term and most underutilized subject. Yeah, agreed. And like I said earlier too, like people don't really talk about what that is or mm -hmm. how to do it. And I think a lot of people think they have their one or two things they think of when they think of self-care mm -hmm. and those don't work for them. No. And so then they think, well, that's just, you know, garbage. I, that's not going to work. So sure, whatever. Yeah, meditation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm going to do know? some breathing. Blah, blah, blah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people honestly don't feel deserving of self-care. They they feel self-care just marches in with guilt as a partner. 
oh, to- people thinking they're not, they don't deserve it, and how dare they take time for themselves. If, like a lot of my uh, mothers, like mm-hmm. my patients who are mothers, mm-hmm. will say that, you know, well, I have too many people relying on me, like, I, I don't have time for that. Like, then they're not going to get dinner or this isn't going to happen. And, and I don't want to put that on them. Right. And and what are you modeling for those kids? Yeah. This is how you take care of life. Run on empty. In mm-hmm. fact, I actually challenge my clients to put gas in their tank when it's a quarter empty. Yes. Just be mindful. Never get into the to the orange. Yeah, to the orange or the red. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the, I think it's a Roosevelt quote where he says, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. Right. You wouldn't wait. Exactly. You don't want to wait for it to come crashing down. Exactly. But we do yeah. that, like, emotionally. So if someone does, we're talking about, like, running in the red and running out of gas. If mm-hmm. someone is in the red or even in the orange for a really long period of time, what can that do to our, our system? Uh, we. I mean, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> it, we got uh, plenty. You know, it starts with just regular energy Um our relationships get more cut off. We don't spend time with people. So now we're turning inward more. We're internalizing. That's where the depression starts to come in. You get short fuses first, then depression. Mm-hmm. All that raises your heart rate and your blood pressure. And then we're looking to eat or drink or take a drug to calm mm-hmm. us down. So now you've gotten into chemistry projects that don't usually go very well. Yeah. And then your adrenals get zapped out. And then, you know, I mean, I I hate to use the C word, but all that stress when we're internalizing can lead from anything to stroke, heart attack, cancer. Yeah, you name it. It's dis-ease, right? That's Mm -hmm. that's what that word means, dis-ease. Interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the sooner we catch it, the better. That's why I do this. I had a heart attack when I was 37. and. I'm like, what am I doing? My, I, I tell people my heart attacked my brain because my brain had all this stuff mm-hmm. it wanted to do and didn't have time for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that makes sense because, we, I mean, my whole motto, like, from the get-go was healthy mind, healthy body mm-hmm. because they are so inextricably linked and yeah. one can definitely hurt the other. Yeah, and get prophylactic about it. Mm-hmm. Like, start taking care of your mental health while the sun is shining. Yeah, Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if someone's at home and they feel like they might be running towards the orange or the red, Mm -hmm. what's something they could do, maybe one or two things they could do today to feel better? So I'm trying to reintroduce the phrase, come to your senses, Mm -hmm. because our senses are not in that thinking part of our brain, our frontal cortex that wants to think our way out of everything. We're animals. We are animals with egomaniacal frontal cortexes. And we need to soothe. So when your brain is doing this and you're feeling that stress, come to your senses. Grab something that smells really good. Those essential oils, they are essential. Feel something cool or something warm. Look at something intriguing, you know, light a fire. Look at a beautiful sunset. Look at flowers. Just something that soothes you visually. Mm -hmm. Music, especially for teenagers. Yes. You know, I can tell the headspace I'm in. If I'm listening to news, I'm like, okay, um, I'm in that headspace. It's head a little too, it's alpha. Yeah. When I'm listening to music, all of a sudden I'm, now the news feels more beta. Oh yeah, beta. Right? Mm-hmm. But the the music now, music calms the savage beast. So we're equipped, we're equipped to calm ourselves. We just don't know that w- we own the the material that we can. Yeah, use. we have it all. It's we have all we Wizard need. Of Oz. Mm-hmm. It is. <laughs> we have our own guy behind the curtains pulling all the levers, right? and we just have to go and pull the right ones. Just kick your click your heels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking Thanks. the time to show us around and and talk about this. Hopefully, it helps some people. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will too. Thank you for what you do. Oh, and yeah. come anytime. Yeah, I would love to. It's so peaceful here. Yay! <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> Wow, that was so cool and educational. I have heard about neurofeedback before, but I had no idea how it worked or even if it worked. Although I will be honest, I did read an article a while back that said Tom Brady uses it to improve his health and his game. And although you know, I am not a fan of the Patriots, go Seahawks, I do recognize just how many times he has won or even just made it to the Super Bowl. So it must work. And you can do it while watching a movie. I mean, come on, I'm gonna have to try this out. 
I also love the way Laura explained how therapy and stress treatment should be holistic, working with our five senses and our brain and body. And again, just like Barry shared before about burnout and the brain, Laura also gave us proof that there are real changes in our brain when we are stressed out and long-term effects if it goes on for too long. Okay, so I could go on and on about that center. It is so amazing what they have going on there. But let's get into your homework for the week. Now that we know how many ways stress can affect us, what are some tools you can use this week to better manage it? Please work on a list of at least five things that you could do to lower your stress level this week. Maybe that's petting a dog or doing guided meditation or even working on a personal art project. Okay, now let's also get that comment section going. What was the most shocking or unexpected thing that you learned in this episode? Are you able to apply that learning to your life? If so, how? Let me know down below and I will see you next week. Bye. Yeah, it's been an issue pretty much my whole life though. Like I, I don't think I ever really, I do sleep. It's not like I don't sleep. I just sleep weird hours. Do you sleep like soundly, like for full chunks or do you like wake up? Nightmares? Like I have nightmares. Uh, every night? Mm-hmm.